Hello folks, good evening and welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our look at the rise of the Third Reich and today we are looking at the education of the younger members of the German population and what was happening immediately after Hitler takes power and perhaps what the long-term visions were for a re-education of the youth under the idea of this new ideology that we now know is inherently evil, but at the time in Germany was perceived perhaps differently. Um, so a fantastic subject. I remind you all, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to click subscribe and click the little bell so you get notifications. And of course, we would welcome you becoming either a member of the YouTube channel or a patron. And as usual, all the links you would need are in the description below, including the links to buying our guests' books. That's in the description below. You can find access to their websites, their social media accounts, all in the links below. So don't forget to expand it and, and have a look at what we have there for you. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce my uh, today's guest. So Dr. Helen Roche is a prof assistant professor at Durham University in the UK and has written this incredible book about the elite Third Reich schools. So there we go. So good evening, Helen. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks. So you have tackled this subject of just exactly what the, the Third Reich did in terms of educating its future leaders, I guess we're talking about. And it's an area that, surprisingly, you have been the first to tackle this. Uh, you know, we talked with Katia on Monday about how many gazillion books there are about the rise of the Third Reich in terms of politics and economics of you. But the education aspect despite being an integral part of what they're doing, seems to have been hidden away. So A, why did you think of doing it? And B, why do you not think someone had done it before? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a really good question. So um, I actually started out my academic career as a classicist doing, you know, ancient history, Latin and Greek and so forth. And when I was looking for a subject for postgraduate study, I started looking at the influence of Sparta on German military education and the Napolas, these Nazi elite schools, which I've been researching, were one of the two case studies along with the Prussian cadet schools. And so I started getting in touch with former pupils as eyewitnesses and so forth. And as I was, you know, doing a bit of research into the background for that, you know, essentially classical reception project, I found, well, hang on, nobody's ever written a monograph on the Napolas. This is crazy. And because at this point, the people I was talking to, the former pupils were in their 80s and, uh, well, a few of them in their 90s, I thought, well, actually, this is a window of opportunity. Mm. You know, I could ask them about everything. And so it, it was kind of serendipity, really. Well, as is often the case, these ideas, sometimes who, who knows where they come from, but the point is you've had them. So um, one of the things I wanted to you know, begin with, you mentioned it there, is we were talking with Katia on Monday about how within the Third Reich, Hitler and Goebbels and other people, they're very good at borrowing ideas from other places, although they want to have their own new Reich, this new way, and we know the evil side of it, they're, they're not averse to borrowing things from elsewhere. And it, it's... It, 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 and it seems that within the schooling, and you can elaborate on this, they're borrowing a little bit of kind of German tradition, what had been working for in Germany for some time, but also looking at, oh, hey, they have this kind of matron boarding school system in Britain. That's kind of interesting. You mentioned Sparta there. So, so you know, Hitler takes power in 1932, 33. Everything starts changing in Germany there. And, and like everything else, the effects of that Reich are going through industry, the railroads, the manufacturing, schooling. So what was the schooling system like kind of in the Weimar era? What was it What was it like before the Third Reich takes, play, takes uh, uh, power? And then what immediate changes came in? Who And who decided on these changes? Yeah, so during the Weimar Republic, I guess, essentially, there was a move to very much liberalise education and so you know the former Prussian cadet schools obviously the Treaty of Versailles meant that they had to be turned into civilian boarding schools which were you know teaching fundamentally democracy and that kind of attitude to the state and 
the first Snappers were then founded in order to kind of undo that uh, more liberal democratic education and kind of take it back to the more militaristic cadet school model, even though they didn't want to have what they called the caste arrogance of the uh, the Prussian system. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's a more specific thing. I think um, we see that kind of thing in general, though, that perhaps when the Third Reich comes to power, it's trying to establish continuities much more with the Second Reich than with the Weimar Republic mm. per se. And you know, the other thing that we, we it strikes me is is there's we, we we think about the immediate sort of short term ambitions of the Reich, and you know we'll be talking tomorrow with Roger Morehouse about the invasion of Poland in 1939, and then the relationship with Soviet Union with Dr. Johnson on on Thursday, but. The Third Reich, you know, we talk about it in that terms of the thousand year Reich. There's a long term plan as well. There's a long term vision as well. So upon the, the, the taking over of power, these these figures that are coming and setting up these elite school, schools, I'm guessing they're having to balance these two, two perhaps slightly contradictory things that they're, they're aiming for. There's this long term solution when they're thinking post they're changing within Europe. Then there's the immediate need to bring people in and educate people. Uh, in this new way, because, you know, we know later on in the war, a lot of um, influence within German families is the kids bringing the ideas to the parents, in a sense. So so this idea of educating the children, therefore, is, is is key to kind of getting these new ideas to hold. So, so you know, you, you talked about, well, we, we haven't talked about it yet, but your research, you research in numerous different countries, lots of different archives. So firstly, what, what information was there to find out? You said you spoke to people who actually went through the schooling system, but was there much, and obviously you, you have enough to write a book, but did, did you, was it easy to find archives or did you have to struggle a bit? Mm. So actually, in the end, I have used material from about 80 different archives in a half a dozen different countries and I started off obviously in Germany there's a lot of stuff in for instance the German Federal Archives in uh, Berlin and the uh, secret uh, privy archive of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation but then if you go to almost any kind of regional archive local archive where there were schools in that area or of course the federal states in Germany have their own state archives you'll find relevant information and then not to mention in Austria and then the occupied territories you know what's now uh, Czechia, Poland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg and uh, Flanders. So, uh, and of course, then, I mean, we might get onto this as well, but because there were these exchange programmes with uh, particularly British public schools mm. and US academies, you find things in archives in those countries as well. So, uh, and also the eyewitnesses I spoke to would often let me see things that were, were in their personal possessions. So in a sense, the problem was not having too little information. It was by far having this vast mass uh, of, of information that I had to somehow synthesize into, you know, to, to 20, uh, 220,000. You're welcome to hold the book up there. There we are. And, and by yeah. the way, folks, the, the book is currently, we're going to talk about it later on, but it's currently available in the hardback edition. And what we want you to do, folks, is send us messages either in the comments here or emails or contact Helen via Twitter or me and say how interested you would be in a, let's be fair, cheaper paperback version because it's one of those academic books that's come out at a rather hefty price point but they've sort of they've kind of held this carrot in front of you saying if you can kind of prove enough people want a paperback it can happen so folks kind of send your messages to helen or to me and we'll try and try and get a few a few dozen reports in and try and get this paperback edition out so we can have access to this but back to the subject in hand so we talked with katty on monday about the legality of the Germans taking power. I mean, they they, they stretched the, the term illegality a little bit, but it was all done within this framework of within the system. Now, we mm -hmm. know today, whether the viewers are in America, Britain or Canada, it takes a long time to change curriculums in, in schools. There's committees, there's boards, there's governing boards, education authorities. Within the education system, how quickly were the Third Reich able to make changes? Did, did they kind of have to go with the system or did they did they break the system? 
Mm. So there are some things where the change had to be gradual. I mean, a really good example of this is with textbooks, because this is in schools all over the Third Reich, that they wanted to change the ideological valency of the textbooks, but they actually couldn't, you know, write and print fully Nazified texts within a very short space of time. I think it took, you know, two or three years for the first ones to mm. um, really hit uh, school library shelves or whatever. So they would sometimes just redact the books or cut out certain pages or like stick things over to, to make sure that the right ideological message was being taught in that interim period. Uh, in terms of the policy, I guess there was uh, a quicker speed to the change because, you know, enacting things like um, more physical education, more pre-military training, although that then became more the preserve for Hitler Youth when it came to uh, civilian schools. Um, and then even, I mean, you mentioned the fact that the, uh, the Napolis came into being, I mean, quite close to the beginning of the Third Reich. They were a birthday present to Hitler from the Reich Education Minister in April 33. And they hadn't really been planned before. This was a very kind of sudden move. And the schools that were first turned into Napolis were kind of told, you know, like a month before, OK, this is what's happening. Uh, so in a sense, there was a chaotic nature to it, I think, both in that specific case and uh, overall. And is it? It, almost like with the burning of the Reichstag that Katia talked about, where they move the opera house and suddenly all the eagles go in and the symbolism and they think about the lighting and they think about the image there. Because you know, they, we're talking about schools that in many cases are converted from however they were running before the system to now the Napoli system of now within the the. the the organization of the Third Reich. There's some obvious things you can do. You can kind of shove some flags and eagles up and some nice mottos above mm -hmm. doors. But as you say, actually phasing in um, textbooks and, and retraining teachers and all those kind of things, that 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 takes, you can't do that overnight. Um, so, so, you know, you're talking about going back to this idea of the inspirations, um, you know, because I like this idea of a little bit of a Spartan things. What, what, we're talking about physical education very being very important. And Katya talked about this idea of the the, the the ideal journey, even yesterday with Edward Westerman, this idea that although alcohol was part of the Third Reich, it wasn't kind of at the public side because they wanted a physical fitness. The the the, the, the German is a, is a specimen. They understood that alcohol was part of this. So with the, with the, with the education system, what what's what do they want these schools to to do? What's the the single kind of biggest thing they want to to bring in? Hmm. I mean, with with the Naples specifically, they want to train future leaders and that can be future leaders in any walk of life. Uh, so whether it's academia or journalism, obviously the military or the party and within that you know, the pre-military training is very important, the physical training, basically everyone has to be able to fight and die for their country. And along with that, the ideological training, which of course bolsters ideas of self-sacrifice, uh, but also, you know, makes people have this fanatical adherence to the Napoli worldview. And broadly speaking, if you take away the leadership element, that's something that we find in the civilian school system as well, uh, the fact that people are being trained into believing that to fight and die for your country is the most important thing, and also new ideas of the national community being defined by race rather than just by, uh, you know, where you've been born and so forth. And is there like a champion of this movement, like we think of Albert Speer in terms of like architecture? Is there someone that the viewers kind of should know about that is the main instigator of this? Ah, this this will be down to a particular minister or politician or educator that is that is the guy who comes up or, or woman possibly with this idea, or is it kind of a more of a committee based thing? Mm. I mean, one important figure, I would say, who's often a bit overlooked in the history of the Third Reich is Bernhard Rust, who was first Prussian education minister and then Reich education minister. And I think in the past, historians have often seen him as quite ineffectual. He suffered from trigeminal neuralgia from a war wound that he'd suffered during World War 
won and that meant that he had kind of frequent headaches and was sometimes not not well enough to deal with things but actually you know he rust was well able to defend his sphere against both goebbels he was really you know a, a annoyed that he didn't have control of education as well as propaganda he was able to preserve uh, bits of his educational empire including the napolis from himmler who was very keen to get as much control over those aspects as possible and a fairly recent book by Anne, Anna Nagel um, called Hitler's Bildungsreformer, Hitler's Educational Reformers uh, in translation. Uh, she you know also stresses that Rust actually led his ministry quite effectively on its own terms even though obviously what he was doing was you know in the service of uh, an evil regime and so forth. Good. So, I mean, we're, we're, people are listening and they're enjoying this a lot. So, they, they, we're, and I think it's a lot of a new subject for most of us, and myself included. This. So, so you know, your your, your process, the archives, and then people who went through this schooling system. So, um, the, the, the going, I'm going to go back, bring up this idea again of the inspirations because that that seems to be key to how this works. So, what, which ideas are they borrowing from where, and how are they kind of managing to kind of put it together into this new idea because it seems a lot of ideas that are in some ways counterintuitive so they, they kind of contradict each other in certain ways because there, there's sometimes schooling can be considered quite liberal in environments and then yet yeah, they're also trying to talk about this kind of authority so which ideas are they borrowing from where which ones are they having to jettison you know you're talking about these exchange programs of britain and and the usa there's clearly things that they are not going to want to bring back from the USA and Britain. So what things did they like and what things did they not want? Yeah, that's a great question because I think what's really interesting about the Napolis is it's a fusion of some things that you might expect, like you know taking Prussian military education as an example from the cadet schools, uh, maybe taking you know ancient Spartan uh, attitudes as something they want to incorporate into their ideology again for you know a militaristic education. That's often been a model. British public schools were also an important model, particularly for the SS officer, who was the second inspector of the schools. He's also quite an important figure called August Heismeyer, who some of you in the audience may have already heard of. Um, and then it also takes things from, you know, reform pedagogy and the turn of the century, early 20th century youth movements, even perhaps things like the Scouts. And you know, we might think of those as well, you know, reform pedagogy is something that's very liberal, but actually taking these aspects, things like more child centred learning, a more personal relationship between teacher and child is something that they were able to use very effectively and were part of what made them seem so attractive and things like, you know, going on camping trips, going on lots of trips abroad and um, singing around the campfire, these um, means of of camaraderie which again uh, we might associate with being more free and easy but they can easily be instrumentalized uh, in this this nazi context as well yeah it's kind of getting them while they're young isn't it? that whole I, I, whole concept of i don't want to use the word brainwashing but it, but it is to a certain extent we had a good question from lorelei come up earlier about how early this plan was thought of when so you think about hitler back in the prison early in the 20s is is this something that the the, the the future leaders are thinking about early on saying we need to get the youth in to buy in whenever we do get our our chance to go to govern to lead we will need to do the to bring the youth in is it an early idea of theirs or does it come in a bit later yeah i mean this specific idea of having elite boarding schools really seems to have been quite a spur of the moment thing we don't really find it a lot in even tracts by you know Joachim Haupt, the first inspector of Annapolis, who was writing quite a lot of pedagogical stuff during the 1920s and 30s. And Ernst Creek, who wrote this book called National Political Education or National Politische Erziehung, uh, which is often credited as you know having some influence on the Annapolis because of, I guess, the word national political. He actually didn't even like the idea of, of boarding schools at all. So I think it's quite hard to trace that directly and 
Hitler himself, he, he never actually visited Annapolis, which is quite interesting. He only became more interested in them, particularly during the war years, seeing them as a source of future officers. But this was really a kind of side project, although obviously in general education and, you know, taking the youth and turning them into fanatical Nazis, you know, fleet as greyhounds, tough as Krupsteel and, and so on, is something that, that Hitler and uh, leading Nazis felt was very important right from the start. It's, it's, it's scary to think that they that they are they are they're planning so far ahead, and I, you know I'll bring it back to my point about Albert Speer again because we know we had this the, the Germans had this idea about what they were going to do with the, the the new capitals and the new cities they were going to create. I mean, we, we can only take obviously what the Napolis did up to the end of 1945 because that's when the war ended. But I'm really interested in in what you were able to find and and, and speaking to people about what. That the plans beyond that were because I say you know we had this idea of the thousand year Reich because it's it, it's scary to think what would have happened three or four generations down the line when you're being people who've who are who've learned who've been taught the experience themselves now teaching the next generation who are now teaching the next generation everything becomes so much more embedded and just normal but mercifully it didn't get to, to take hold for more than a, you know 15 years or so but the long-term aims what was there what's there written down about that yeah i mean there is quite a bit uh Heismeyer in particular had very grandiose plans so he aimed that you know by 1945 there were actually about 44 schools in existence not all of them were up to the full complement he envisaged that there ought to be a hundred he was making plans for them to be established not just in the countries i've mentioned but also in norway in neutral supposedly switzerland you know this was all on the cards probably you know if the nazis had taken over britain there would have been plans to um, have them in this country as well uh, and the idea also was that they would soon build all new campuses uh, that were kind of fitting for them in regional styles and that pupils and teachers would be able to you know go from one school to another to experience all of the different parts of Germany and appreciate the fatherland and the whole of the Reich and we see that there were some of these schools deliberately founded in the Eastern territories to aid Germanization of, you know, ethnic German, um, wow. Czech and Polish children. And the son of the Czech, I think, education minister, Emanuel Morawiecki, was actually sent to Annapolis in the Reich. And the idea was that you would take these children, educate them at Annapolis in the Reich and bring German children and educate them in these Eastern territories. Uh, and that they would become, you know, warrior farmers, SS, Wehrbauer, or whatever, and contribute to that push of colonization eastward. So, yeah, there were a lot of grandiose plans, also for a monumental campus in Berlin, which visiting dignitaries would be able to visit from all over the world and stuff like that. Yeah, wow. And I'm, and I'm guessing also, with the, 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 going back to the short term aim and long term aim, because you said earlier about creating leaders with the ambitions of the, the Third Reich to expand its empire and take power, and you're looking at more kind of military leaders initially, but had they then gone to get all these areas, then you're looking for more like business leaders and people have mentioned the sidebar there, you know, educators, lawyers, uh, uh, judges, um, people who end up, you know, even joining perhaps the, the church, you know, educating future generations of um uh, of priests as well within the system so so the short-term aims in a sense are kind of this this empire expansion but then maintaining and controlling it and we you know we, i'm reminded of those those programs in you know like in norway with german military marrying kind of local girls and kind of creating a new a new mini generation so it's it's it, it, it the subject came up a couple of times this week is that how, how scary was it doing the research realizing kind of the what could have been i mean we obviously we focus on the loss of life in the holocaust the tragic immediate death toll but the the almost the long-term changes in some ways are as chilling if they managed to achieve this how how they could have influenced way beyond uh their own borders you're saying that they're bringing it bringing this education idea to eastern europe as well it's uh, you know, was it scary reading some of the ideas 
Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of points I, I'd love to pick up on that in terms of, you know, planned futures and perhaps actual futures. Um, there was this great collection of actual CVs of pupils at NPA Schulpforter, one of Germany's humanistic, uh, premier humanistic gymnasium, maybe a bit like the, the Winchester of Germany, if you like, which got hmm. turned to Annapola in 1935. And this is CVs written by kind of 17, 18 year olds who are about to graduate. And it's fascinating because they list what they want to be. And yeah, a lot of them do want to be, you know, SS officers or military men, but, you know, one of them wants to be a sinologist and study Tibet. And one of them wants to, you know, someone to be doctors and dentists. Uh, journalists, you know, you can see this whole spectrum represented that they're really envisaging themselves at this point, which is still 1938 or so, you know, going into all these walks of life. And then kind of building on that, it's really interesting to see where former pupils went in reality after 1945 and what they ended up doing. And just you know, a tiny cross section of my interviewees. One of them was uh, NATO commander in chief for wow. Central Europe. Um, one of them was a former Austrian justice minister. Uh, one of them was Erich Honecker's right hand man when he led the uh, East German youth organization. And in both East Germany and West Germany, Napola graduates were actually headhunted for military positions in, in both the Bundeswehr and the Nationale Volksarmee, the uh, East German army. Despite, you know, the sort of communist regime, obviously you'd think they'd want to avoid uh, Napola pupils with a barge pole. And in some cases, you know, that's true. But when they saw people who they wanted to get into military positions, they just knew that the military training they'd had was so excellent that they kind of abandoned those scruples in a way. Wow. So so what we're kind of saying is, although the the motivation behind this education was, I don't want to use the word evil, but that's kind of what it is. It is still a good education system. It is that there is merit to the process. It is it is giving people a good a good. I'm using speech marks there education because that brings on to the a question a question from from Lorelei again there about the, the parents because we're talking about these schools being offered as a birthday present to Hitler in in 1933-34. So this is for most Germans for most people they had not yet realized just how shitty the German ra the new regime was. You know they were unaware of where it was going. So when these schools are being set up. What's the perception of parents? You know, are they wanting their children to join these schools? Is it something they're looking to? Is it, are they wary of it? Is it, is it a competition for place? How are they finding these kids? Where are they coming from and who, 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 who is behind it and who's against it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, Interestingly, when it comes to the selection process, the schools really preferred, instead of parents like making applications for their children, they got all primary school teachers in each local area to send forward suggestions of children. And it wasn't that parents couldn't make applications, and some did, but that was deemed to be a much less efficient means of um, getting the right kind of, of children. So you have some parents who think, wow, this would be a great opportunity. I mean, one thing I should mention here also is that these schools are kind of trying to be a flagship for, if you like, the socialist aspects of national socialism, right. because they provide a lot of free or heavily subsidised places specifically to attract children of, uh, you know, working families and farmers' families, uh, this so-called, you know, egalitarianism within the Volksgemeinschaft, within the national uh, community that, that the regime is trying to create. And so for some parents, they might think, well, OK, it's going to be a bit ideological, but they're going to get a free education and mm. we can't afford to send them to you know, secondary school otherwise. So maybe let's go with it. And you even get some instances of sons of families who are actually oppositional in some way. So the sons of Max Habermann, who would have been the trade union kind of leader if Stauffenberg's plot had come to fruition. Right. They were at Napoli Schulforta and you know, they were actually fine. I mean, whether that's because the regime has any inkling of that and thinks, well, maybe we can train them in our, our own way, or whether it's just 
sort of they don't really care they just want good kind of material um i'm not completely sure it may vary from case to case but there's a, a broad spectrum and sometimes you get you know pupils putting in applications or pupils being selected and their parents really don't want it but they end up going anyway well wow, because i mean I, I think my immediate understanding would be when i heard about your book is that these are all little you know third right generals sending off their kids and the, re the real kind of the but actually it makes sense to bring in the people from the families that are maybe opposed to this new regime because you can convert them. The, the, the kids of the, 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 the nutters are already converted, I suppose, is what I'm saying. So it's better to kind of spread, the, bring the kids in from a greater variety of, like I say, emphasize this socialist aspect and bring people and kind of convert families, like I said earlier, by converting the kids first. And then, then the ideas then go upwards to the parents and the, and the, and the other people within the families. So it kind of makes sense to try and to, to keep this, to, to, to make foundations for a long-term Reich is convert. You've got the people who voted for you, but you want to win the, over the people who didn't vote for you, I suppose mm -hmm. is a good way of summarising it. Yeah. I mean, there's just one great anecdote, which I've, I've got in the book where there's the son of uh, the father ends up in a, a punishment battalion because he's in some way oppositional. The mother's quite oppositional too. And the son goes to the Napola. And then when he comes home for the holidays, he and his dad are constantly fighting about their, you know, conflicting political beliefs. And then he's actually at home when the Stauffenberg plot takes place and uh, his mother's listening to the radio. Um, his, his father's in this punishment battalion at this point, so he's not there. Mm. And uh, the mother kind of says, oh, thank God, or something. And he starts screaming at him. He's like, how can you say that? You know, I'm being educated at Annapolis. How dare you? And their relationship is just completely breaking down because he's been, you know, turned into this uh, fanatic. And, you know, I don't have very many cases that are so explicit as that, but oh. I think there definitely are cases where the parental uh, relationship with the child just breaks down because of that. And we got the question there saying, were there similar system for, for girls? Well, we should, haven't made it clear that this is not exclusively for boys. It is it, it, mo more boys than girls, but it is a, it, it is both sexes, isn't it? And were, were they separate schools? I'm assuming it was by, by gender, the schools. Yeah. So there were only about four schools for girls. So the, you know, in terms of the, uh, predominance is definitely for the boys schools kind of 40 versus four uh but what's really interesting about this is that a lot of the nazi officials basically thought you know in the finance ministry people like martin bormann they just hated the idea that girls could have any sort of elite education at all and then you have heismeyer who's actually married to gertrude schultz clink the reich women's leader and he's kind of fighting with these bureaucrats and saying no look it's really important that we have girls who are trained you know who can do female leadership positions and this is also really important for the development of the Reich and you know they'll become also wives and mothers who can you know teach their children in the right way and so forth but we need this so he's almost being kind of pseudo-feminist in this this not weird, weirdly progressive in a in a, in a to, in an yeah. awful environment it's it again it's these contradictions that are so fascinating that's when we tackle these kind of subjects on this channel it's the things that you think it's all kind of black and white and you realize these, these big areas of gray in the middle you know that when you said some of these people who've been taught went on to normal jobs and normal careers within an accepted environment the guy working for nato that kind of goes against what you would think but um to bring it back to basics i think everyone watching would have a kind of an idea of what a Nazi school would be like, kind of Hitler salute classes at 10 o'clock to 11. I'm kind of being facetious there. But but mm -hmm. what, what was the education? Obviously, there is going to be a military side. There is going to be lots of physical education and there's going to be sort of cadet rifle range type stuff. But that, that's obviously only part of it. So to so run us through, is, is the experience broadly the same over these sort of 44 schools or is it widely different depending on what region of Germany you're in? Yeah, it's it's generally the same. It starts out more experimental. There's more leeway for the individual schools and the individual headmasters to kind of find a curriculum that works. And then they start having 
these meetings of the headmasters and kind of conferences where people can share best practice and then begin to codify it a bit more, you know, after the first few years of the Third Reich. Um, we do find differences in the different uh, federal states. So you got kind of copycat Naples being founded in Württemberg and uh, Saxony and also in uh, Anhalt. And those were kind of, some of them originally more of a kind of Hitler Youth orientation, but then the education ministry and the, the inspectorate of Annapolis says, okay, we want to kind of unify this. And eventually those schools in the, the lender, the federal states get taken over by the Reich in 1942 and kind of centrally uh, administered as well. So we have these interesting kind of tensions between the center and, and the periphery, the federal federal states, which you see more generally uh, within the Nazi state as well. But yeah, the, the curriculum, I would say, in many cases was broadly the same with perhaps, you know, a few schools which followed a humanistic curriculum. So they had Latin and ancient Greek, like Schulforte, which I mentioned, and Ilfeld and a couple of others. Uh, the girls' schools, um, which we were just talking about, obviously they have slight differences, so there's less of a pre-military emphasis, as you might expect, but uh, they're doing things that's more related to care of uh, children and livestock and a bit of cookery and domestic science stuff. But they still, you know, they did things like missions, which happened in the holidays. This is a really interesting aspect of the, the program where the boys would have to go for, you know, maybe as much as two months, they would live with families of miners or farmers or industrial labourers, and they would uh, live with them and then work as apprentice miners or apprentice um, factory workers or as, as farm labourers for that entire time. And the idea was that they would get to know how the working man lived, what their hardships were, a bit of kind of social engineering and spying on the families as well. And wow. then that when they were older, they would know how to lead people better from having had that experience and the girls also do that but they'll just go to you know a textile mill for instance or a a, a spinning factory or something rather than than going down a mine shaft i mean health and safety nowadays would would have a fit <laughs> well yeah i mean and, and again we know we're talking about the, how it was quite a sudden the thing it came in and you know early in the reich really but i'm imagining that we talked about this idea you can't instantly change an education system you've got teachers who've been in careers for a long time and and books and textbooks but i'm, I'm assuming if you were a teacher in one of these schools that trying to cling on to old ideas and not follow that you were quickly kind of removed and someone else would take your place i'm imagining kind of give it three or four years get to sort of 37 38 these schools are are, are, are more more um set in their Nazi ways than they had been earlier. I guess, is, is that kind of the, the, how they went? Yeah, I mean, there are two points to make here, which is one that it was very common for all but the most already fanatical teachers to just have to leave. And mm. same for headmasters, that there's actually a really big turnover of staff. And Napoli teachers was basically supposed to be under 30. They were supposed to be physically fit enough to take part in all of the sport, all of the cross country war games and stuff alongside their charges uh, and that would obviously rule out a lot of you know your bog standard pedagogues I guess and the headmasters as well like the first three headmasters uh, they didn't really have any pedagogical background at all one of them was a, a war poet uh, one of them was an SS gynaecologist and one was a former police officer who'd lost his job because he was an SA activist in the in the Weimar Republic and they were deliberately chosen not because they had any background in teaching but because they were seen as you know fanatical for the cause and would be able to lead people in 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 war games and take that kind of much more militaristic lead on things and they didn't really have to administer uh the like curriculum they had a director of studies the uh, Unterrichtsleiter who would do that I think that's a very telling comment you said there they're bringing people in based on their ideological kind of um reputation more than their educational value it tells you 
as, as seemingly efficient as the education system appears, perhaps on the surface, there is a very sinister uh, aspect behind it of, of radicalizing and changing the mindset of people. The education comes second to the, the reinforcement of this, of this new ideology. And, and, and so with that in mind, let's go back to this idea, because a couple of people mentioned on the side about, about the exchanges. So because it, it sounds a little, you know, little little Nazis being sent off on a train to go to a school in Britain, and that it 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 it, it sounds bizarre. We, we we were mentioning a fact there was the school in Bexhill on Sea uh, where some German kids were being educated in the English system there. So these exchanges, who instigated them? I'm assuming it was the Germans instigate uh, wanting to send their kids to Britain and to America. So how did that start, and how did it go? Yeah, so this was kind of planned from quite early on. Uh, the exchange program starts really 1934 and continues right up until basically August 1939. And uh, final uh, exchanges had been planned for September, August time, but, you know, didn't all take place for obvious reasons. Yeah. And yeah, it was definitely the German side that was pushing this, they wanted to, you know, push pro-Nazi propaganda in a sense. They wanted to, uh, you know, make these connections with uh, the British, well, not just upper classes, but, you know, potentially forging leadership kind of coalitions in some way. And the idea of race also played a part in that, you know, the idea that, you know, Britain had this empire that was ruling over all of these races and, uh, you know, that uh, the Nazi empire could go one better, that kind of thing. And there was this, I guess, facade of disinterested friendship, which was masking these more propagandistic aims. But on the British side, particularly, and, and in the US as well, this was really taken at, at face value. And um, I've got this quotation, I think it's from the headmaster of Kingswood School, A.B. Sackett, who said, you know, perhaps we can influence the sons of senior Nazis through discussion and friendship, even though he hadn't been fully convinced of the aims of the exchanges from the start. So and um, we can also see if you look, I, I've got sources from both sides of the Anglo-German divide, and you can see as international tensions build the tensions within those exchange relationships uh, as well. And, and leading on from that, Scott Grimwood is asking, did the Nazis select specific schools? Did they kind of put, send lots of letters and hope someone responded? Were there particular, I think, I think the question he's asking is, were there particular schools that they were interested in because they sent the right message or they had something that they wanted to kind of, be, I, I like this idea you said about this idea of, by sending kids over it on exchange, it's kind of legitimizing to some extent the Third Reich because you can't send your Luftwaffe over in, in a legitimate way. You can send products of an education system it's it's so but but there's the schools they're choosing it, there's obviously some thought going behind it which ones which ones did they think were the perfect ones to send kids to yeah well what's really interesting about this is that there's a much wider spectrum of schools you might expect it to be just you know the really high profile public schools like uh, Eton and Harrow and, and Westminster and Winchester and those did all take part either in exchanges or in, in sporting tournaments with the Napolis but actually there's also ones like you know Kingswood School in Bath which I mentioned or the Lees School in Cambridge which were both Methodist foundations you know, quite quite devout, uh, which you might not expect the very kind of anti-religious uh, Napolers to want to engage with them. You've got Dauncey School in Wiltshire, which was kind of agricultural um, foundation, which was more for kind of uh, middle class sons of, you know, uh, farmers and, and so forth. So, and in some ways, they kind of preferred that because they were like, look at the caste system that we've got in the public schools. Like, we're going one better. Dauncey's is actually closer to what we're trying to do in terms of, of egalitarianism and so forth. But pretty much most, I think, you know, boarding public schools that you would have heard of um, and some that you wouldn't were involved in this in some way, it's it's fairly widespread. Which is which brings up that uh, that idea we now look back on of how 
in a sense, naive the world was right up until the outbreak of World War II, just exactly what was going on within Germany. We, we take it, we, we assume now the world was watching, going tut, tut, tut. This is, and some people were, but a lot of people just were, were, were naive in their ignorance about exactly what was happening there. And it's fascinating. We had a couple of questions earlier, and people have mentioned it about the, the religious aspect, because Germany, Katia mentioned it on Monday, you know, lots of Lutherans, lots of Catholics, Catholics. And obviously we think even today how education and, and religious education kind of go hand in hand. And you talked about the Methodist schools in England that there were exchanges with. How did the Germans kind of integrate religion within the, this, this new Napoli system or, 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 or justify it or make it work? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, their ultimate goal was to basically eradicate Christian religion and religious instruction entirely, and they couldn't do that immediately right at the beginning. So they started by kind of phasing out things like RE and, and confirmation classes and making it more and more difficult for, for children uh, at the schools to attend services. They deliberately would, in the schools that were founded in existing uh, buildings or schools, they would tend to turn the chapel into some kind of festal hall. You know, people often talk about Nazism as a political religion, and this was definitely what was going on. Instead of a church service, you'd have a kind of ritual ceremonies with, you know, bowls of flame or kind of going out into the woods and jumping over a, a, a bonfire or kind of speech choirs and, and things like that. Um, so they they even had plans, uh, particularly in Austria, where they would take over former monasteries and monastic schools as, as part of that appropriation of, of the Catholic um, heritage and, and anti-Catholic drive. There were plans to, I think, turn uh, basically Gutweig Abbey, which is, you know, a wonderful jewel of Baroque architecture and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. One architect had plans to basically just demolish the entire chapel and uh, do something else with it. Then there were plans to turn uh, Lambach, uh, which was the abbey where Hitler sang as a choir boy, to turn the chapel uh, or the abbey there into like a swimming pool or something uh, or maybe that was for our, what, one of those catholic um wow. institutions anyway um so this is something i actually want to do more more work on because i could only mention it quite fleetingly in the book well we'll come to that later on this idea of you know that you are forging a new path in this and you know i said to, to edward yes we talk about alcohol you know that hopefully these books lead to people doing more work and people say hang on that was good, that book, but there's this angle that hasn't been explored. There's this angle, and it will lead to a whole kind of subset of history study because it is fascinating. I want to bring it back to a question um, uh, Dave asked about kind of students returning from these exchange programs because um, in a word, it differed how Dave asked it. But obviously, where the Germans are sending their kids to Britain and, and America, so they're, they're, they're sending what they want to be seen and probably briefing these kids. Don't mention that bit big up that bit but i'm thinking about the kids that go to germany again the same process when 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 you're when your little Brit british freddie freddie has come back from his visit to germany back to his school you know do you think they were being shown the full representation of these german schools or for the when they were there were they given very much a kind of a managed version of it to take back to britain yeah i mean that's a really good question i think you know to an extent they were being treated as guests and so they would take part in certain lessons but not in others they would be taken on lots of trips and things like that and they would be taking part in you know the broad sweep of school life they would see how things function there might be some aspects that they wouldn't have seen so much of um and in answer to the the question that you brought up there uh i don't think there was really any need to re-indoctrinate the napola pupils when they came back because they were already specially selected in a sense to be the ones who would most you know, not be receptive to kind of yeah. uh, democratic ideology and most committed uh, to the cause. So really, all they saw in both Britain and America kind of just reinforced their own views uh, of what they thought these countries were and what their relationship with the Third Reich should be and their ideological views, I think, in a sense. Wow. So 
I mean, again, this idea about a, re a regular school day there, because, you know, you're saying about the fact that it took a while to phase in new textbooks and things like that. And how much, you know, what, what age, what's the youngest age kid that would be at these schools? Uh, Ten. So they're still fairly impressionable at that age there. So I'm imagining, you know, you, you, there's an opportunity there to really hammer home ideology without it looking like you're, you're hammering it home in that you could have your like your math maths problems you know if peter has five something and he gives away two in those messages you could mention things about jews or or or, or russians or or food or something and you could make these messages so did that stuff start getting stuff start getting into the system where these kind of these hidden messages within the education or was it more in your face i think it was a bit of both actually i mean the Napolis used the same textbooks, more or less, as schools throughout the Reich. They weren't like the Adolf Hitler schools, which had specially written textbooks. So the kind of things you mentioned, like uh, maths problems, uh, which are, you know, either anti-Semitic or, you know, should you, uh, a worker earns this much a year and mm -hmm. a, a disabled person costs this much, you know, how mu how many workers could, could you pay with, you know, those kinds yeah. of, you know, toxic maths questions, they were definitely exposed to that. There's one book which was used at Schulporter, which was specifically designed by the Luftwaffe, and it was all questions about, you know, ballistics and bombs and, uh, you know, flight paths and things to get people deliberately interested in becoming uh, airmen. Um, and, yeah, so all that kind of indoctrinatory ideology that you would find in normal schools, you would find present in the Napolis as well. But of course, because they're, if you like, a total institution, they're boarding schools. Whereas if you're at a, you know, normal day school, you go home and perhaps you have slightly different messages at home with your parents, if your parents aren't completely fanatical Nazis, uh, you never really escape that apart from perhaps in the school holidays. So it's almost a, a self-encompassing world, which, which it's very hard to escape from the worldview. And one of the things that's interesting about talking to my eyewitnesses, my interviewees, is that they'll often say, well, you know, I didn't really notice anything Thing ideological about the education and you know to an extent that might be wow. cognitive dissonance but I think also it's just because you know they've been steeped in that for so long their whole world even as you know younger children had been shaped by that and you know you kind of wouldn't necessarily notice within the context of the Third Reich if something's particularly ideological because you're just surrounded by that kind of ideology but that said, the teachers were, you know, picked and sent to, on further ideological training. They were supposed to be particularly committed. And, you know, you had these assemblies and evenings where the, you know, ideology and the propaganda was pushed in almost every aspect of school life, whether it's amateur dramatics or trips to borderlands to kind of try and get ethnic Germans in the region to want to come home to the right. Like everything has some kind of political agenda. Nothing is ever completely neutral at these schools. I find it fascinating what you said there about some of these pupils you spoke to not realizing they are part of this ideological um, process, because my, my connection to that is I remember, you know, I'm 53 soon. The, the, the people I knew when I was a young guy who went to boarding school, I mean, I went to a grammar school, but it was a day school, but though, in the world they lived in, that was the world they lived. They didn't know that other people didn't live in that world. That their their world was rugby trips and so and so and 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 so they they associate the only their only friends were within that same world as them. And when they left that institution and joined the real world, it was kind of something that's quite. I remember people I knew then. It was quite a an eye opener for them. So this isn't how the rest of the world is. No, no, you've been living in a in a bubble. In this case, it was not a not an evil bubble, although I'm sure some people watching and say their school probably was evil on some level. But we're talking about the Third Reich doing something really, really sinister behind this. And the idea that you're being ed you're being educated in evil without it really being obvious to you is, is a scary thought, which I think is therefore a good time to mention. There's a paper a couple people mentioned it. What's the what is the connection with the Hitler Youth? Because we those who watch my channel and we talk about the, the 12th um, Hitler Youth Division, norming some of that. We, this is the military side of things. How does the Napola system connect with the Hitler Youth, uh, if it does at all, indeed? 
Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, initially, the Napolis were kind of not connected to the Hitler Youth for the most part, apart from the ones that I've mentioned in, in Württemberg and Anhalt and Saxony had a bit more of a Hitler Youth connection. But uh, they actually, <clears throat> there was a bit of a rivalry between uh you know, the Hitler Youth leader, Baldur von Schirach, the Reich Organisation leader, Robert Ley, and then, you know, the Education Ministry and, and the Napolis. And it was said that Schirach and Ley actually founded these competing elite schools, specifically party elite schools, which were on a Hitler Youth model, the Adolf Hitler schools in 1937, because allegedly Lai's son or Lai's nephew didn't get into Annapolis. So they were like, OK, we're going to run these instead. I'm not sure whether, whether that's proven. But until the Hitler Youth law came in, the collaboration between the Napolis and the Hitler Youth was kind of more fragmented. And then after that came in, the Napolis would have their own, both kind of autonomous Hitler Youth groups, but they would also send uh, their pupils to then lead local Hitler Youth groups in the area. Same goes for the girls' schools and the BDM, the League of German Girls, in, in the same way. So they were getting already as youngsters that kind of leadership of, uh, you know, people who weren't seen as so elite, and that could also lead to tensions, whether over, over girls or just the Napoli people say, oh, you know, they're not ideological enough or they're just kind of country bumpkins, like, why aren't they doing what we say sort of thing? Um, yeah. Um, great, great response to that. And um, maybe a simple question there, but was there a point when all the educators had to be party members? Mm, this is also really interesting. So technically, they were supposed to be, but when I actually looked at a load of personnel documents, at least for the Prussian Napolis, which are held in the Prussian Privy Archives in Dahlem, there's a significant percentage who actually weren't party members. I mean, it's, you know, maybe four or five out of 50. I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's still surprising. And there are also quite a lot who were members of other party organisations, but didn't join until after the, you know, the party stopped taking applications in May 33, even when they probably could have done. So the date at which some of them are joining the party is again later than you would suspect. I, I definitely found that both surprising and interesting. Um, we, we had a question, it's probably a bit, bit, bit specific, but I'll, kind of, I'll word it differently from Dermot there saying about, was there any data on when kid, first kids learned things like section attack drills? But I'm going to kind of change it differently. I, I guess part of what they're teaching is is the following of leadership, the follow the discipline of, of, of obeying those above you, which is, I mean, it's central to all schooling to some extent. You do what your teachers tell you, but within the system they're trying to... In, set up here it's much more of a discipline place which brings us back to this kind of spartan idea of of and, and and the following that person who is more senior to you kind of blindly so following orders i'm guessing is is, is key so i'm guessing that starts earlier it starts when you're 10 and 10 or 11 i assume yeah, well, one thing I'd like to bring up here is just that as part of the selection test, and the, the whole selection process was very long drawn out, and it culminated with a week-long entrance exam, at least, you know, up until mid-war years. And one of the key things that decided whether you'd be selected or not was what's called a test of courage. And this meant something like jumping from a three-story balcony and, you know, hoping that there'd be a blanket held to catch you, which obviously there was, but not knowing if there was or not, and just jumping without hesitating, or if you were a non-swimmer, jumping from a high diving board into the swimming pool or the Baltic Sea, again, without hesitation. Uh, so even before, they're, they're kind of pre-selected before they arrive as pupils for that kind of willingness to obey orders. And then that continues all in terms of, you know, the hierarchy, the classes are called two which translates as platoons. The teachers are called Zugführer, like platoon leader. And similarly with the 
the ranks of the hierarchy of the young man and uh, that they were called young man and the pupils so young man zug für her and young man gruppen für her stuff like that uh, and in terms of military training as well a lot of it was i'm not sure about attack drills specifically but they would regularly have to do these cross country war games where you'd have a scenario you'd have a thread around your uh, wrist or your elbow and if the thread was snapped uh, you were dead uh, and you know your team would be denoted by what color the thread was and they even had these maneuvers which you know massed 3000 pupils taking part in all of the you know high commando of the Wehrmacht and Himmler and people coming to watch where you'd have these massive war games involving you know field telephony and motorcycles and and all kinds of things and kind of massed battles at the end uh, which took place once a year again until the war started um, as well as things like you know learning to shoot and so forth so in terms of you know basically learning what it's like to be at least playing at being on the front line they had a lot of experience of that which then when world war ii comes along so many of them just instantly get promoted as officers all of the high wehrmacht navy luftwaffe people are just say you know admirals and so forth saying you know we've never had an apple of people who we haven't thought was excellent like please give us more and this wow. competition between all of the branches of the armed forces and particularly the waffen ss the ssa but like who can get the most napola pupils and go and drum up support and you know even soldiers uh, generals coming along and saying oh our soldiers have saved all our chocolate for you you know kind of almost bribing them with chocolate wow, that is that scary thought, but it, again it's 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 the idea that these were successful, what they did, as, as awful as the idea behind were, they were clearly very, very good schools. And I, I very much like this idea, you know, that this jumping out of the windows, the type thing you're saying is it, you're teaching blind obedience more than initiative. You know, when I think of some of the things I did at my grammar school, those sort of team building things like, you know, crossing imaginary rivers with tires and planks and stuff. It was all about you working out the ideas and some, but I see this as much more of a, it's not your idea to have someone senior to you will tell you what to do. It's about, of course, you're given instruction how to be a leader yourself, but it's mainly about following the person above you in the chain, which when we talk about the, I'm going off on a tangent a bit, one of Woody's rabbit holes is when we talk about some of the failings of the German military is that kind of my commander hasn't told me what to do yet. I see that in Normandy, you know, there's not that there's not as much initiative at a lower level than you would say in a British or American unit. So in a weird way, although they're efficiently creating these, these rule followers, they're at the same time removing some of this ability to think on your, on your feet. So again, going back to this long-term idea, I wonder, had the right carried on, what would have happened in 30 or 40 years? Now, you've got an entire generation after generation of blindly obedient, but no one's got any ideas anymore. It's a fascinating, fascinating kind of concept, really. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think you're probably right. I think there must also have been, you know, people putting everyone into leadership positions to kind of see how they would react, certainly in terms of, you know, everyone having an opportunity to kind of lead the class at some point and perhaps also in these war games as well. Because one of the things that actually, again, my interviewees talk about a lot, they have these narratives that they tell about how they survived the end of the war in 1945. And a lot of them tell these stories about how, you know, we managed to, you know, prevail and get over the mountains and not get captured by, you know, Allied troops or, or Russian troops. And it was our Napola training that gave us, you know, the ability to do that, the toughness to survive, the capacity to kind of, you know, lead ourselves in that way. And I don't think there's any reason to, to particularly doubt that, although in some cases they may be, you know, bigging it up slightly. But they at least have this very developed self-belief in what mm. the Napola taught them and uh, to go back to what you were saying earlier I mean yeah I, I kind of faced this dilemma because what I really want to say you know previous scholarship really 
kind of just saw the Naples as kind of chaotic and disorganized and kind of saying they didn't achieve anything. And that's partly, I think, because, um, you know, the main book from 1973, which talks about the Nazi elite schools, is by a former Adolf Hitler school pupil. And he kind of wants to minimize the impact and go, oh, well, they weren't that elite after all. It's, it's fine, you know. Um, but actually, you know, in terms of the military training and even in terms of the calibre of the academic education, uh, you know, leaving aside the ideology, uh, they clearly were effective, even if the effectiveness was in the service of something terrible. And it's, yeah. you know, really important to make that distinction. But I think just because we wish that, that these schools hadn't achieved anything, uh, you know, we still can't overlook what they did manage to do, despite the fact that it... We, we don't like finding anything to say that the Germans did well. It's, it's against our natural instincts to condemn everything they did as just being awful. But to kind of find any kind of weird merit in what they're doing actually these were working very well is sort of against our, our, our human instincts to some extent uh connects to some way with a, a question we have from the history explorer there about were there any repercussions for former students of these schools because you know we know in 44 and 45 when the allies are capturing people you know if you're an ss you had a harder time understanding if you would for their match for example was there was there something perhaps if, if allies interrogate people and they found out they had a bat was there something it was something they were looking for was there anything worse a, a worst price they had to pay did they have a reputation amongst the allies or indeed within german society when they went back after the war yeah thank you that's a really great question uh so yes if you were found to have been at annapola you were kind of initially in one of these higher levels of you know that who were considered with more suspicion or potentially you might not be allowed back into higher education or back to secondary school. And certainly, you know, in the British zone, former Napoli pupils who were allowed back to school were monitored very carefully. And the school teachers at their new schools had to send reports saying, you know, whether they were any kind of suspicious pro-Nazi activity going on. And in the GDR in um, East Germany, or, or what would become East Germany in the Soviet mm -hmm. Own. Uh, that was even more marked. So you get cases of, of former pupils being sent to camps like Bautzen or even potentially to kind of uh, Russian camps and being questioned by the NKVD and, uh, you know, having their prospects potentially ruined. And, and it's definitely the case that there are quite a lot of former pupils who, you know, might have gone to university and so forth, but actually had to undertake a more vocational career uh, because of that. And there are others who, until, you know, they reached retirement or until I spoke to them, hadn't really spoken about the fact that they'd been at Annapolis at all because they were worried about uh, ramifications and, you know, adverse effects on their their careers and their reputations. Wow, so great response. So I think to kind of begin to round things up, I mean, we're talking about this being the first book on this subject. And, you know, we're talking about a lot on this channel about historiography and where we're going next and the body of work we look we have it to look back from the past i mean what what can we learn about the third reich generally by looking at the napola because you know people who are who are watching this who, who are studying for example you know ss police battalions or or or, or production or the economy or the work of adam twos looking at their education system what will we be able to take from that to the other fields of study with regards to the third reich yeah, I mean, that's a really fantastic question and uh, one that I've really sought to answer in the book, because I feel that actually looking at the Napoli is, is kind of a microcosm or a petri dish, if you like, where you can see so much of, you know, tendencies of things that are going on in the Third Reich more generally, either writ particularly large or, or at least reflected. And, you know, things like this hyper selective ideology of who gets to be part of it. It's like a hyper selective version of the the Volksgemeinschaft, the national community. You've got this radically unequal but complementary approach to gender politics. You've got mm. Germanization drives. I mean, Himmler saw the Napolis as really crucial to what he was trying to do in both Eastern and Western Europe in terms of Germanizing native or, a quote, ethnic German populations. Um, you've got just this, this more general attitude towards 
youth youth being the future and having to kind of ideal ideologically train them up uh so it, just in so many ways i think it, it shines light on new aspects of that uh, by looking at it through education and through the lives of children if you like which sometimes get a bit uh pushed to the side yeah. perhaps when we discuss uh history more generally and it has, we talked about at the beginning, it has this kind of almost predictive element that it is, it is looking at a future, right? Whereas we kind of, when we just study the battles, we have to end when those battles physically ended in 1945. But this, because it is about creating generations of a, of a future type of German, it has this as a predictive quality of saying, it's not just where the Germans took it, but where they were hoping to take it to, which gives us an ability to, to, to look at what the, you know, those couple of those Robert Harris books about fatherland, what would have happened had the Germans won. But, and I think that's what's intriguing to me is there's, there's clear signs of, the, of, of this, this long-term vision that we kind of lose sight of because of it being a, a Mercifully, I will add again, a short lived, um, less than two decades regime. So it has that quality as well. So, I mean, we talked before we went on online about the fact you have been done a lot of TV, TV work interviews and the Spiegel and, and in Germany about this. So you, you've created a bit of a buzz about this, this side of things. So what, what, what next? You said you, you feel you want to do some more study about this, but what, what next for you in terms of studying this field? And apart from the paperback edition, which people are already saying that they're going to send you messages because they're saying that it's a bit pricey right now. They, we agree it's a bit pricey right now, but there is a, there is a solution folks. So email, um, Helen, and we can we can get that to the publisher, and maybe we can see a nice paperback edition. But what what's next in terms of continuing this study for you? Yeah, so actually, I'm just in the process of uh, selling my proposal for my next book to uh, a trade publisher. So it would be aimed at a, a more popular audience and hopefully, yeah, affordable for everyone. And that's going to be looking at uh, the allure of fascism in interwar Europe. So it will be looking at Nazism and also Italian fascism and mm. how perceive that both within those regimes and also observers uh, looking from the outside and why, why people were seduced by this, why they thought it was the political system of the future. And in particular, I'll be looking at diaries, uh, letters, you know, contemporary, what we call ego documents, people writing about how they felt at the time. And I guess where I'm coming from with that is, you know, perhaps it can also help us to understand the dangers of that seduction in the present. But, you know, it's yeah. not it recognize it. the warning signs, so to speak. Well, we've had a couple just to end things. I've had a couple of questions. People saying um, notable alumni of these schools. You know, what what are names of people that we can say? Here's someone we can look at that, that was a product of their system. People that, that I think you mentioned a couple already, but anyone else we haven't we haven't mentioned? Yeah, I mean, the people I, I mentioned are probably uh, the most important ones, like Harold Offner, Leopold Kalupa, um, uh, yeah, Hans Schoenecker. I mean, not necessarily people that everyone would have heard of. There's also Helmut Karasek, who is a, a kind of author and um, TV personality. Uh, I think he might be still alive, actually, in Germany. Um yeah, I mean, perhaps no one kind of, a few big business people, I think, as well. I mean, I, I hasten to add that a lot of Napoli pupils really did just kind of lead normal lives. It's not like they're all becoming leaders in Western East Germany, but, uh, you know, a few of them did. And again, this is this uh, this long term vision. If you have if you have. 13 in 1933 you know so born in 1920 you're still only you know a young man or young person when the war ends these people hadn't maybe got to the point in their career where they would have made a name for themselves but again if we talk about the fact that the germans maybe could have won the war 10 15 years down the line mid 50s then you're maybe seeing these products coming because they're then in their 40s and 50s then you would have maybe seen this influence of a generation of people who come through that school but luckily we 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 it was cut off before it got to that point, which is, brings us this idea, this sort of predictive nature. But yeah, no, it's a fascinating discussion. And this idea about the allure of fashion, it's something that I, well, as a tour guide here in Normandy, when people have said to me, how did, how did people become Nazis? And you go, well, you have to go back and try and look at it through the lens of what it was like in 1933, 1932. And, and, and Katia made those points on Monday. You know, the, the, we're going to go off down a rabbit hole again, but Europe was in a very bad place then. Germany had massive, great problems. And 
for many people, this seemed it was the solution. It, it wasn't the solution. We know that now. That doesn't mean it wasn't seen uh, Brexit uh, as a solution at the time. So um, anyway, it's been fantastic talking to you. I, I will already extend a welcome to you when this, this next book comes along. Please come back and talk about it. But in the meantime, folks, I want to reinforce this idea that if we want to see a paperback edition of this book, uh, pester Helen and me with emails and, and things saying you would get it and, and, and which library you'd buy a copy for, et cetera, et cetera. And if we can provide a nice set of data for Helen for that, and then those who are watching this on catch up as well in the comments, I will keep sending anything I can to Helen. If she can provide a nice list of people, it might just persuade the publishers to, to get a nice affordable edition out there. So we'll, so do what you can folks. So, um, I'll just remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second, Helen. So tomorrow night, we continue the look at the Third Reich with the fascinating look at the relationship Germany had with Poland, with the inimitable Roger Morehouse, who wrote First to Fight and other books about the, the German invasion of Poland and also the Soviet invasion of Poland, just how pivotal Poland was to the, the, the beginning of World War II. So that's a fascinating show tomorrow night, same time, 7 p.m. UK time. Then Thursday, we're looking at Alexander Clifford. We're looking at Hindenburg and some of those other important German figures in the pre-war era. And then Friday, uh, Ian Una, Una Johnson is talking about the Soviet German pact, the uh, Faustian bargain, as he talked about, another fascinating show. So lots more coming your way. As I said at the beginning, don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to be consider becoming a main member or a patron and send in those emails so we can get a paper, a paperback edition of this book. But in the meantime, you can go to Helen's website below and send a message by then, see her some of her or hear some of her other appearances on podcasts, things like that. So go ahead and do that. But at, as of now, I will say thank you very much to my guest, my guest, uh, uh, Dr. Roche. And uh, have you enjoyed talking to our viewers tonight? Oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed myself. Brilliant. So I will invite you back again in the next book. So there we are. Thank you very much, everybody. This is Paul Brad for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow evening. Thank you very much for your attention today. Cheers, everybody. Bye.